Deuteronomy chapter 3, starting in verse number 1. Then we turned and went up the way to Bashan. And Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us, he and all his people, to battle at Indre. And the Lord said unto me, Fear him not, for I will deliver him and all his people and his land into thy hand. And thou shalt do unto him as thou didst unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, which dwelled at Heshbon. So the Lord our God delivered into our hands Og also, the king of Bashan, and all his people, and we smote him until none was left to him remaining. And we took all his cities at, the time, at that time. There was not a city which we took not from them. Three score cities, all the region of Argob, the kingdom of Og, and Bashan. All these cities were fenced with high walls, gates, and bars beside unwalled towns a great many. And we utterly destroyed them as we did unto Sihon, king of Heshbon, utterly destroying the men, women, and children of every city. But all the cattle and the spoil of the cities we took for a prey to ourselves. And we took at that time out of the hand of the two kings of the Amorites the land that was on this side Jordan from the river of Arnon unto Mount Hermon. Which Hermon the Sidonians call Sirion and the Amorites call it Shinar. All the cities of the plain and all Gilead and all Bashan unto uh, Salca and Edri, cities of the kingdom of Og in Bashan. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. And this land which we possessed at that time from Aror, which is by the river Arnon, and half Mount Gilead, and the cities thereof, gave I unto the Reubenites and to the Gadites. And the rest of Gilead and all Bashan, being the kingdom of Og, gave I unto the half tribe of, tribe of Manasseh, all the region of Gar Argob, with all Bashan, which was called the land of giants. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you so much for loving us. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together and to study your word. Lord, I'm so grateful that you give us your word to study. Lord, I'm grateful that we can trust that we have uh, the words that you intend for us to have. And we can trust your word tonight. And it is our sole authority for faith and practice. Lord, we're grateful for the teachings in the Old Testament. and The historical accounts that show us ultimately your power and your long suffering. Lord, it shows your wrath and it shows your mercy. Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand as we study tonight. I pray that you ex exhort our hearts to grow closer to you. Lord, I pray that you'd help me not to preach my opinion, but be faithful to preach your word. Lord, give us the words to say. And Lord, I pray that your word would affect change in the hearts and minds of the hearer. Lord, I pray for these next few moments as we study together that we would see the importance of these events. These are not just our archaic uh, events that happened thousands of years ago. But Lord, these are recorded for us forever to show us who you are. And to show us your great and wonderful graciousness. And your willingness to show mercy on the kingdom of men. Lord, your willingness to not only show mercy, but your faithfulness to keep your promises. Lord, we pray now once again that you would speak through us. Lord, help us to learn as we desire to study. In Christ's name, we pray all these things. Amen. And amen. Continuing with the reminder, and if you'll, if you'll look and if you'll kind of think back over the past several weeks, the, the title of our study is Remember and Obey. Deuteronomy, they're, they're at the cusp of going into the land of promise, and these are the offspring of the men of war that had been completely wiped out because of their lack of faith in God to give them the land that they had been promised. This is the offspring that is left after 38 years, 40 years total in the wilderness, wandering. God giving provision. God still taking care of them. Remember and obey. Tonight we see a portion of the land that is given and the instruction to fight. And so we see in this remembrance the giving of the land and the instruction to fight. This is the section that we're at. Because now we're starting to see some of the land on that side, Jordan, before going into Canaan, being given to some of the children of Israel. I want us to very quickly note a few things. And if, we're, if you're taking notes this evening, I have three things uh, that, that we should take note on. And I want you to notice, number one, the mention of Og, the king of Bashan. 
Og, the king of Bashan. It's here we have a greater commentary. In Deuteronomy chapter 3, really verses 1 through 11, we have a great commentary on Numbers chapter 21. So turn to Numbers, keep your place in Deuteronomy. We're going to go to the book of Numbers, and you're going to want to be able to flip back and forth. So if you need to, rip a map out of the back of your Bible and use that as a bookmark. I'm just kidding, don't do that. I I had a pastor that used to say that all the time because uh, a lot of the maps in some of the uh, uh, in some of the modern maps are just kind of pointless. You get to have you ever tried to look at that to figure out where you're at while you're reading, and you're like, I don't even know where Bashan is because it's not titled Bashan in the map in the back. It's titled what it's called later in the book of Ezekiel. And so anyway, that's just it's just one of those things. Uh, uh, me personally, I got me an interactive map. You know what an interactive map is? It, I got I literally got it for free. Somebody sent me an interactive map, and it's just a big old PDF, and somebody has overlaid the maps, and I can click certain things on that, and it shows me on the maps. And it's all just Israel, right, and the Mediterranean, that area, and uh, I can click Old Testament stories, and it overlays the map, and I'm like, that's pretty... That's pretty cool. I like it. Uh, I've had that for a while. So I don't need the maps in my Bible. I just rip them out, use them as bookmarks. All right, Deuteronomy ch- or Numbers chapter 21. I was trying to buy you some time so you could find it. Numbers chapter 21. Go to the end. Look at verse 33. Verse 33. Last three verses of this chapter. And they turned and went up by the way of Bashan. And Og, the king of Bashan, went out against him, against them, he and all his people, to the battle at Indre. And the Lord said unto Moses, Fear him not, for I have delivered him into thy hands and all his people in his land. And thou shalt do to him as thou didst to Sihon, king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbon. So they smote him and his sons and all his people, until there was none left uh, him alive, and they possessed his land. Now that's interesting to me. Because we notice a few things about the king of Bashan here in Deuteronomy chapter 3. But just reading Numbers 21, it wouldn't seem as if that battle was that big of a deal. Because there's only three verses dedicated to it. There's only three verses in the book of Deuteronomy. And it comes right on the, uh, in the book of Numbers chapter 21. And it comes right on the cusp of the defeat of Sihon. And then you see uh, uh, that they go in and the Amorites and Heshbon, the city of Sinai, all the things that we dealt with last week. And so now Israel's dwelling in the land of the Amorites. And Moses, verse 32, sent to spy out Jezir. And they went and they took the villages thereof and drove out the Amorites that were there. Just just a few highlights of what the people of Israel did. Now, remember, let's, let's, let's back up a little bit just by way of review and, and, and help me out if you can. Were these people that had known war before this? No. When they went up against Sihon, the king, you remember, when they went up against in the Heshbon, and they went up against the king Sihon, these were people who had never seen war. All of the men of warfare had been wasted, the Bible says. They had died out. So now they go against Sihon in this land. And if you'll remember our study from the past few weeks in Deuteronomy chapter 2, they go into these lands that had giants. They were told not to mess with those lands because they were given to Lot's children for an inheritance. But now they come up to Heshbon. And as they did uh, there to Sihon, king of the Amorites, at Heshbon, they're going to do the same thing to the king of Bashan and to his people. So they've already won one battle. Then they've got the land of the Amorites that they dealt with and the two kings of the Amorites. But then we have this Og of Bashan that is mentioned. A few things stand out to us if you're taking notes under point number one. Letter A, we see that we we need to be reminded in Deuteronomy chapter 3 that it's God that promised to deliver the king and those people to the people of Israel. It's God that promised to deliver them. Oh, and by the way, he kept his promise. Look at verse 2 and 3. Back to Deuteronomy 3. Verse 2, and the Lord said unto me, fear him not, for I will deliver him and all his people and his land into thy hand, and thou shalt do unto him as thou didst unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbon. So the Lord our God, what? Delivered. God delivered Og. 
second thing we need to pay attention to is why Og is so important. Og, the Bible says, letter B, was the last of the king giants, or the giant kings. He was the last of the giant kings. Look at verse 11, Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 11. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it after the cubit of a man. What do we learn from this? If you'll remember, think back, what was it that caused the spies to fear man rather than God? There were giants in the land. There were giants in that land of promise. Hey, Moses, we can't, listen, listen, we're just telling you that, that what God said about that land, it is certainly a land flowing with milk and honey. Remember, they came back with the grapes of Eshkel and a cluster, two men had to carry a cluster of grapes between them. But, but Moses, there's giants and we seem to them as grasshoppers and the Bible says it discouraged the people of Israel. Well, now, 38 years later, they're back into these areas, and here we find that God has told them, all right, you're going to go against Sihon and Heshbon, you're going to go and fight, stay out of the lands of Lot, I've promised to them for for his children, but I want you to go against this guy, and they defeat him. And I could imagine, they're all excited in that, and now they're told, all right, now go against the king, the giant king. It's interesting to me that the book of Numbers doesn't mention that he's a giant. But Deuteronomy does. Moses is doing something specific here for them in Deuteronomy. Remember, the entire point of the book is to prepare the people to go into the land of promise. And Moses is pointing them. You remember, Og, that you we just not many days ago, you were told to go against him and to fight him. And God said, fear him not. For I will deliver him. And Moses says, remember, God delivered him. And if you'll remember something about Og, he was a king. And he was the last of the remnant of giants. Here's how we, here's, here's just a little bit. Here's really all that the Bible tells us about Og in regards to his uh, stature. And it tells us based on the bed that he slept on. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. It had to be strong enough to hold the big fella. Amen. Had to be made of iron. Now notice it says it was nine cubits long. That's almost 14 feet long. Nine cubits. Almost 14 feet long. That's how long the bed was. But then notice how wide it was. Four cubits wide. That's almost six feet wide. That's a big old boy. Amen. If he could fit on a 13 by 6, and that was his bed, and he was called a giant, that's a big old boy. And that's the last of the remnant of the giants up until this part. Now, we know there's other giants that show up because we we haven't even made it to King David yet. That's later on in history. But Moses is reminding them, why is all this significant for the people of Israel? Because they're getting ready to go into Canaan, and they're getting ready to go and face some people where there still were some giants on that side. And he's reminding them, see, you see this? You men who who have not even seen war, but just these recent ones, and God's telling us to go, remember, God delivered him into our hands. Remember, God, the focus of fear because of the report of the ten spies had been proven to be unfounded. Friend, when God says, I have given that over to you, he means it. When he said to the people of Israel, you're going to go into that land and I've already prepared it and you're going to defeat the people and you're going to, that's your land. God keeps his promises. He promised to deliver and he kept the promise regardless of the giants. In the first account that we just looked at in Numbers 21, you would think because of such a great battle that this would be, uh, or at least because of such a great victory, that there would have been more details that were given. At least there at the end of that chapter as they get ready to go into the land. But, but right after those three verses in chapter 22, and the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side, Jordan, by Jericho. And then we, we, we read the report of Balak. And we spend a lot of time learning about Balak and Balaam that we'll look at in, over, the, over the course of the next few studies. 
Moses reiterates the account with greater detail, not only, not only once, but also at the end of the book. When we get to Deuteronomy chapter 29, he reminds them of the victory over Og, uh, the king over Bashan. But this isn't the only time that we see Og mentioned by an Old Testament writer. We also see him mentioned in Joshua. If you will, if you're taking notes, I encourage you to write these down and look at the accounts. And every time you see Og mentioned by one of these prophets or one of these mighty leaders, Joshua chapter 2, Joshua chapter 9, Joshua chapter 13. Nehemiah references him in, in Nehemiah chapter 9 when confessing of God's goodness to the people of Israel. Now, I want us to look at David's recollection in Psalm 135. Let's look, if you will, at Psalm 135. And then right after that, we're going to look at Psalm 136. Psalm 135 and Psalm 136. In Psalm 135, jump down, if you will, to verse 6. Whosoever the Lord pleased... That did he in heaven and in earth, in the seas and all the deep places. He causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings for the rain. He bringeth the wind out of his treasuries. Who smote the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. Who sent tokens and wonders into the midst of thee, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and upon all his servants. Those tokens and wonders, he's talking about the plagues. Who smote great nations and slew mighty kings. Sihon, king of the Amorites. Well, we studied him last week. And Og, king of Bashan. And all the kingdoms of Canaan. And gave their land for an heritage and heritage unto Israel, his people. You see, the psalmist David is even writing of the account of God delivering to the mighty kings. Why? Let's go back to verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the name of the Lord. Praise Him, O ye servants of the Lord. Man, if there's one thing that I could get, that if I could, in all of my years of ministry, if I could get people to just focus on doing one thing, it would be praise God with your life. Because He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our praise. If you'll remember, we, we kind of mentioned this, but, but if you study the word worship and the word praise, worship is what we do because of who He is. We worship God because He is God. We worship Him because He is holy. We worship Him because He is creator. And what's interesting is in the first several instances where we see worship in the word of God, we don't see anybody doing this. We see them doing this. Why? Because he's king. He is the only ruler that matters in all of eternity. And that's what worship is. Praise is what we do because of what God has done. So we praise him for his blessings. We praise him for his grace. We praise him for his mercy. We praise him for his goodness. We praise Him because He is worthy to be praised, because He is a good God. And the psalmist David said, praise ye the Lord. I love it. In the first verse, praise ye the Lord, praise ye the name of the Lord, praise Him, O ye servants of the Lord. I think praise is important. And then he goes on to give great detail of how God blessed His people Israel. Look at verse 2, Psalm 135, verse 2. Ye that stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is what? Good. Sing praises unto His name, for it is what? Pleasant. Side note, does it say it's pleasant if it sounds good and if you can carry a tune in a bucket? Is that what it says? No, sing praises unto His name, for it's pleasant. Why? Because He's worthy. 
God been good to you in your life? You should praise Him for it. Has God delivered you from some things? You should praise Him for it. It's right after this that we see God, uh, through the psalmist David, start to unveil the reason for the heart of praise from the psalmist. The Lord hath chosen Jacob unto himself and Israel for his peculiar treasure. They're a chosen people. Praise God, because they're a chosen people. By the way, we were chosen to sanctification. Praise God, because we couldn't be sanctified without him. Amen. Sanctified, set apart so he could use us. We, we couldn't be sanctified if the Bible says that we're chosen to be saints, called to be saints. For I know that the Lord, verse 5, is great and that our Lord is above all gods. Do you serve the Lord that's above all gods? Praise him. Verse 6, whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he in heaven. Remember Romans 9? Who are we to question God? He does what he pleases. Why? Because he's God. And then we see as we got down to verse uh, 9 and 10 and 11 and 12. He's starting to unfold and to praise God for victories. Now there's something I want us to notice about this victory. David didn't exist when these victories occurred. David didn't exist when, he, when, when God led the people of, uh, of Israel out of the bondage of Egypt. David didn't exist. He wasn't alive yet. Neither was Jesse, his dad. And yet we see here David praising God for the deliverance from Egypt. By the way, David also wasn't alive when, they, when, they smote, when God smote the great nations and slew the mighty kings. David wasn't alive. And yet he praised God for that deliverance. For his people. We need to learn to praise God. Now look at Psalm 136. Jump towards the end of that chapter. Shouldn't be hard to find. It's just Some of it's on the same page. Some might be on a different page. Psalm 136. Look at verse 17. To him which smote great kings. For his mercy endureth forever. And slew famous kings. For his mercy endureth forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endureth forever. And Og, the king of Bashan, for his mercy endureth forever. And gave their land for an inheritance, for his mercy endureth forever. And even an heritage unto Israel, his servant, for his mercy endureth forever. Who remembered us in our lowest state, for his mercy endureth forever. Who hath redeemed us from our enemies, for his mercy endureth forever. Who giveth food to all flesh, for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks unto the God of heaven, for his mercy endureth forever. Do you, you see something that's happening in every verse in that chapter? All 26 verses, all 26 verses in the Psalm 136, there's a statement, and then there's, for his mercy endureth forever. And within the context of David thanking God. Look back at verse 1. That's what we're seeing here. Psalm 136, verse number 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks unto the God of gods, for His mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for His mercy endureth forever. To Him who are alone doth great wonders. For his mercy endureth forever. To him that by wisdom made the heavens. For his mercy endureth forever. You see a theme? Give thanks to God. Why do we give thanks to God? Because of all these things. Oh, and by the way, because his mercy endureth forever. And within all of the context of the heart of the psalmist, pouring out onto the pages, writing about the mercy of God, he remembers Og, the mighty king, who God slew. Why? For his mercy endureth forever. We serve a merciful God that deserves to be praised. He deserves to be praised for all of His mighty works in our lives. By the way, at the end of Psalm 136 that we looked at, who giveth food to all flesh, for His mercy endureth forever. Do you, do you realize the reason you can eat? I work hard. No, because God allows you to have that. 
You see, we got to reprogram our brain sometimes. Well, I deserve that because I worked for it. Man, you don't deserve nothing. Everything that we have in this life, God has given to us. Amen? Everything. Oh, I better, that's my money. No, it's God's. He's loaned it to you. Be a good steward. Amen? Do well with it. Why? For His mercy endureth forever. I love it. It begins with giving thanks because He's merciful. It ends with giving thanks. And within the middle of it, He points the reader to a part in Jewish history that He wasn't even there for, but He knew about it. Why? Because it was something of a great deliverance. Og, the king of Bashan, the giant king. Friend, it's important that we remember often the victories. We remember the victories that God allows us to have. Why? Because it helps us to avoid iniquity and idolatry when we remember the victories. It helps us to avoid iniquity and idolatry and instead it causes us to focus on His goodness. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for His mercy endureth forever. Romans 8.31 couldn't help but come up and study this week is, is preparing and, and finalizing and studying all of these notes for, for, for these, these battles and these great victories that the people of Israel uh, experienced. Romans 8.31, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Og, the king of Bashan. Number two, very quickly. We'll finish number 2 and 3. We see the inheritance on this side, Jordan. Look at verse 12. And this land which we possessed at that time from Eror, which is by the river Arnon, and half Mount Gilead, and the cities thereof, gave I unto the Reubenites and to the Gadites, and the rest of Gilead and all Bashan, being the kingdom of Og, gave I unto the half-tribe of Manasseh, all the region of Argob, with all Bashan, which was called the land of giants. Jer, the son of Manasseh, took all the country of Argob unto the coast of Geshurai and Mechathai and called them after his own name, Bashan Havoth Jer, unto this day. And I gave Gilead unto Mehir and unto the Reubenites and unto the Gadites, I gave from Gilead, even to the river Arnon, half the valley and the border, even unto the river Jabbok, which is the border of the children of Ammon. The plain also in Jordan and the coast thereof, from Chinnereth, even unto the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, under Ashdoth Pisgah, eastward. Now, here in these verses we see that the possession of the two and a half tribes on this side Jordan before they ever cross into the land of promise but yet they were not permitted to rest in that land now go with me if you will and keep your place here in in, in Deuteronomy 3 but we're also going to look at Numbers 32 now Numbers 32 in Numbers 32 we have the account of these three tribes, two and a half tribes, requesting that the inheritance be the land that they've already won. The land that they've already won for a possession. These tribes requested to obtain this land for their inheritance and not to go over Jordan. This land was a land that was plenteous for cattle. Now, I'm going to make a statement. It's a side note, and I encourage you to study it. But how many of you... The name Bashan sounds familiar, other than the 55,000 times I've just said it tonight. I believe it's Psalm 22. The Bible talks about, the Psalm 22 is the prophecy of the suffering Savior. Psalm 22, if I'm not mistaken, hold on, let me just look. We're doing good on time. We're going to get done like one minute early, so we're good. Amen. Yeah, Psalm 22. Let's look at it. Let's just look at this for fun. All right, we're going we're gonna to finish this up, and we're going we're gonna to wrap it all up. This is a side note. This is for free. All right, I'm not going to charge you for this. All right? This is a side note tonight. Psalm 22. Look at Psalm 22. Ever wonder why Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Here's what people say. Well, God can't look upon sin. Well, that's not true. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, beholding the evil and the good. Right? 
The Bible says if I go uh, uh, down into hell, the Lord is there. You, you can't escape Him. It has nothing to do with that. Every statement of Jesus, all seven statements of Christ on the cross has prophetic significance tying Him to the Old Testament. Remember when He told the Pharisees, when you see the Son of Man high and lifted up, then you'll know. This is when they knew. When he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, he cried out, and he was quoting Psalm 22 and verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, I want you to take the time to read Psalm 22 and think about the account of the crucifixion. It talks about them, uh, uh, let's, let's, let's just look. Verse 6, I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn and they shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. That sounds like the New Testament account of the crucifixion. Why? Because Psalm 22 is the prophetic suffering Savior. It's in this, when you get down to verse 11... Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of what? Bashan have beset me. There's a reason why Bashan is mentioned in Scripture. There's a prophetic tie to the suffering Savior. But there's also, there's also a tie to the cattle. And, and I'm not going to go through all of the references, but it's a really neat study. Look up the word Bashan. If you've got your Bible app or something, look up the word Bashan. And specifically Ezekiel. That one will throw your mind for a spin. Because it talks about the princes of Bashan. Or it talks about the princes uh, uh, and all of the, uh, uh, the cattle of Bashan. And then Amos talks about the kind of Bashan. Why? Numbers 32. Bashan was a place that was good for cattle. It was the place for cattle. Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of cattle. And when they saw the land of Jazir and the land of Gilead, that behold, the place was a place for cattle. And the children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spake unto Moses and unto Eliezer the priest and the prince of the congregation, saying, Adaroth and Dibon and Jazir and Nimrah and Heshbon and Elihah and Sheba and Nebo and Beon, even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel, is a land for what? Cattle. And so you have Reuben and Gad and the half tribes of Manasseh wanting this land because they took care of cattle. And so they asked, verse 5, Wherefore said they, If we have found grace in thy sight, let this land be given unto thy servants for a possession, and bring us not over Jordan. But then look at verse 6, And Moses said unto the children of Gad, and to the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war, and shall ye sit here? And wherefore discourage ye the heart of the children of Israel from going over in the land which the Lord hath given them? Thus did your fathers when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. You see, the problem was they discouraged the people of Israel, the spies. That was the issue. They didn't trust God. They discouraged their hearts. And Moses said, are you trying to discourage the hearts of your brethren again? Now, I want us to notice something. The land was a land that was plenteous for cattle, and these tribes requested for this land to be their inheritance. But the third thing that we see in, in our text in Deuteronomy chapter 3, tied to Numbers chapter 32, we see that they are still commanded to aid in the warfare. They are commanded, number three, to aid in the warfare. Deuteronomy 3.18, here we see the possession of the two and a half tribes on this side Jordan, yet they were not permitted to rest in their land. Instead, we see the command that all the, that are meet for war should go with Israel, their brethren, and fight until. <coughs> Excuse me. Notice the account in Numbers, they were to fight until. A, they're to fight until the Lord had given rest to all their brethren. The instruction to wait for the Lord's command would be paramount for them. Look at uh, Numbers 32. Jump down, uh, uh, jump down. Let's jump down to verse 13. And the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years. All the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was consumed. And behold, ye are risen up in your father's stead, an increase of sinful men to augment yet the fierce anger of the Lord toward Israel. For if ye turn away from after him, 
Ye will yet again leave them in the wilderness, and ye shall destroy all this people. Verse 16, they came near unto him and said, We will build sheepfolds here for our cattle and cities for our little ones, but we ourselves will go ready armed. So they were commanded to aid in the warfare. Their wives and their children could stay in the land on this side, Jordan, but the, the fighting men, they weren't allowed to just sit while the rest of their brethren fought. They were instructed they were instructed to go and to fight with them. Even if one of the brethren had not gotten their inheritance, none of the tribes would be at peace. If one of the tribes... So here we learn that they were instructed to aid in warfare. So now we see the remembrance. The remembrance of what God has done and how God has delivered. The remembrance of the inheritance on this side, Jordan. Yes, you can have this, but you're still going to go fight. And then we see the remembrance of their command to aid in the warfare. We see that even through all of this, there's still more instruction for Joshua. Notice verse 21. I'll read this verse. Or let's, we'll read verse 20. Verse 20. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 20, and then we're done. Until the Lord hath given rest unto your brethren as well as unto you, and until they all possess the land which the Lord your God hath given them beyond Jordan, and then shall ye return every man unto his possession which I have given you. We see all throughout these accounts, all throughout the histories of God said, take that land, God said, take that land, God said, take that land. All through this, Moses is saying, God gave that land. God gave that land. God gave that battle. God gave that victory. Praise God for His mercy endureth forever. Let's stand and be dismissed in a word of prayer.